Hello. I would like to introduce the Larich, which is a, a new, uh, very versatile, multifaceted input utility module. Um, something I've been working on for quite a while. Um, maybe not as a whole, but as uh, the, the individual components that make up uh, various techniques and uh, capabilities for getting uh, external control into, into a modular system. Uh, so you see this patch is controlling a multitude of different things and you know, there's lots of ins and outs to this module. Uh, in a nutshell, we have a stereo line to modular, step up preamp stage. Uh, there's an audio enhancement circuit, which uh, adds a bit of wave shaping and harmonic distortion. Envelope follower with a variable attack release, uh, threshold definable gate. And of course, a foot controller or uh, you know, hand controller, depending on whether you've got it on table or on floor. Uh, yeah, so this uh, gives you gates, triggers and lots of control. So you can be hands-free or remote over different aspects of, of a patch. Uh, I'll, I'll work my way through the various stages of it and give uh, a good range of patch examples I think, for uh, how to make some you know, inter interesting sounds either with variable control or uh, yeah, there's lots to show. Hope you enjoy. Let's uh, dive into dive into this module. Uh, I'll start from the top down, as a, that seems to make sense. Uh, so yeah, at the at the very top, we have a stereo line-in to modular gain stage, or a preamp. So this is designed for 3.5mm uh, stereo audio sources. So uh, that could come from a phone or any you know, consumer or pro-level gear that has a headphone output. Uh, so I'm, I'm just running... Ableton here, I'm playing back some acoustic drum samples I recorded recently and this is just coming straight from the headphone output headphone output jack um, so you can see we've already got a LED indicator showing a level on this uh, this thing's got a pretty ridiculous level of gain on it so all the way down and is, is roughly uh, one gain ratio so it's uh, if you put like one volt in, you should get like, you know, maybe 1.1 volt out or something like that. So one to one. Um, and calculation wise, it's it's somewhere in the region of, of plus 40 dB of gain that you can get from uh, driving this thing. Uh, so for reference, I've got the the balanced line output level from the, the cure here set to approximately its its unity gain point. So when it's when it's pointing at the, the LEDs, that's 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 uh, a, a rough benchmark for plus four dBU as a reference point, so that that, that works nicely if the uh, you know, general modular levels going in converted to to balanced line output. Um, I've got this patch left to left at the moment, and this is just mono to dual mono uh, when patched only into the left input of the, the output module. Uh, when you patch from only the left output on the Larich at the top here. Uh, we're actually getting a mono sum of both right and left together. So if I put a dummy patch cable into the right output, we've heard the, the level drop a bit there, so that's uh, you know, probably about 3 dB drop as they're, you know, we're basically getting a mono sum from both. If I patch this to the right channel, then it's a, it's, you know, it's a stereo drum sample, so the overheads are panned. The you know, right and high up panned accordingly as well. So what I'll do, I'll gently roll down my output level and bring up my input gain, and we'll kind of get a sense of where the where the headroom sits on this. There we go. So that's a. Uh, hard clipping quite aggressively at this stage. Um, it's not necessarily uh, 
something you'd want, but um, if you're looking for a very aggressive distortion stage, that that could could work quite nicely. There we go. Put that back to a nicer, cleaner throughput. Yeah, so a nice, uh, quick and easy way to get uh, line level sources straight into straight into modular, and um, uh, you can actually even get away with certain instruments plugged in. Like uh, I've I've been testing running guitar straight in. Uh, you need to boost the gain quite a lot, and then you know you might want to boost the highs a bit, or uh, you know like shape that with a, a filter after the fact. But uh, yeah, on a pinch you can get away with using this as a, a crude instrument input. But uh, it's it's very much optimized for line level signals. Uh, yeah, let's uh, move on down the module. Okay, I'll bring this back to just a mono signal, and let's uh, take a look at this, the next stage down. So, directly below, we've got an uh, enhanced channel. So, this is actually a, a broken out, isolated implementation of the the input stage that I developed for both the looper and the arbor. So on the looper specific, uh, especially, uh, it was very much designed to ensure that uh, audio coming in that's getting to the, the audio codec or the, the, the module sound card is never going to get a chance to to digitally clip. So it will never it will never hit that saturation point. It will saturate in, in the analog domain long before it would get a chance to, to clip digitally. Uh, so there's a bit of a, you know a dynamic range compression effectively, but the the other goal was to mimic the the response of recording to analog tape, um, and the the circuit suited nicely like transitioning onto the arbor. So this is that section broken out specifically for uh, modular level processing. Uh, so if I patch from the output, um, actually before that, if we look at this switch here, so this is a. Uh, a normal source uh, selection. So you can see it's a uh, up position that's pulling a mono sum of our line to modular source, and that's linking it to the normal pins of both the enhance input and the the lower envelope follower section. Uh, so we can see the the amplitude is actually passing through here. If I go in the down position, uh, this little pattern might be familiar. There we go. Uh, so this is actually a built-in condenser microphone capsule, uh, the exact same implementation as is on the Arbor. Uh, so this is to source that you patch from the output of the enhanced channel, and that is taking uh, the microphone as a source normal to these two pins. So it could be used to you know, directly control the envelope follower as well as use it as an audio source up to modular level. I'm going to put the switch in the up position, and that's pulling a mono sum of our line source. So in here, it's really starting to saturate more. Like the the low end, especially, gets a lot more uh, body to it. Um, to compare, let's listen to it without the enhanced channel. Dry and then through the channel. There's uh, a bit more, yeah, it's essentially limiting applied through wave shaping. Uh, what I'll do for a, a more direct comparison to you know, a broad waveform, let's look at. There we go. Here's a raw triangle wave. Listen to that directly. And let's monitor that through through our enhanced channel. So I'll come out from the channel one and I'll patch that into channel four so we can monitor it and visualize it. Match the same amplitude scaling. Here we go. So all the way down and it will attenuate the signal completely. And as we bring it up, you can see, especially with the triangle wave, we're getting, we're still retaining those peaks, top and bottom, uh, but there is a bit of non-linear shaping. So it's kind of very slightly getting that shark fin 
a, a, you know, a logarithmic rise exponential fall. And as we max it out, we're getting pretty close to a sine wave. It's maybe slightly less symmetrical than a, a pure sine wave would be. Uh, if we look at the sine wave for comparison there. Yeah, so it's limiting the amplitude to a point. Well, not a literal point, but to, to, a, to a degree. Um, with some non-linear offset shaping. So you can hear it's rolling off those upper harmonics on the triangle wave, but uh, it's not... It's not technically filtering, it's actually uh, wave shaping that's being applied. So when we think about that in the context of complex audio, it's, uh, it's more like amplitude peak uh, limiting. Audio enhancement, or uh, subtle wave shaping for uh, more raw waveform examples. So this brings us down to our follower section, which is a uh, an envelope follower, or uh, I think a more appropriate term is probably uh, amplitude follower or voltage follower. Um, so before I get into some examples showing it as a more typical envelope follower use case, uh, I thought it'd be good to touch on the sort of nuts and bolts of what's actually happening in this, this signal processor. Um, uh, so input here, which can draw from normal source from either the microphone or mono some of the left and right line to modular signal, uh, or you can patch directly in. Uh, the signal seen at the input first hits a full wave rectifier, which uh, what that does, it takes anything that's below zero volts and inverts it, folds it positive. So. A good clear way to demonstrate that is if I use a raw triangle wave as a as a reference waveform. Here we go. So here's my triangle wave. Uh, what I'll do, I'll monitor this directly. I'll maybe uh, split a few signals left and right, and then in post, I'll I'll recombine them to dual mono for reference purposes. So, nice clean triangle wave from the CSL and I'm going to now patch that into my envelope follower. And I'll take attack and release all the way down. Uh, threshold don't need to worry about at the moment. And let's come out of this. I'll use the positive output and we'll run this through the uh, fourth channel here on the on the oscilloscope. So what we can see, we now have a new triangle wave, which uh, the Fourier rectifier has taken anything below that zero line and folded it positive. And in practice, with a triangle wave, this has now given us a twice frequency triangle wave. Patch this to the right. There we go. So, of course, we've lost half the amplitude and it's unipolar positive offset, but that's given us a, an octave up through wave shaping, which in itself can be quite a, a useful technique. Sonically, it can be quite interesting. You know, having a hard left, hard right like this is quite a... An interesting twist on just a, a basic triangle wave. Um, what we can see is at a certain point we start to lose amplitude. Uh, so this is this is due to the, the the minimum slew rates of the attack and release or rise and fall um, slew rate. What I'll do first, I'm going to run our source triangle wave through a vinca and use this to. DC offset, the starting triangle wave positive. Bias it up, reduce the amplitude. There we go. So 
now that I'm in the full unipolar positive domain, uh, there's no rectification occurring, so it's now a, a voltage follower, a signal follower. So you can see, at a certain point, the yellow triangle is starting to lose amplitude. Let's find that starting point, let's move it about. Move it there. It's so maybe about 400, 500 hertz ballpark before we start to really get amplitude reduction. So we can actually think of that as our uh, low pass filtering cutoff frequency. Where anything above 500 hertz is going to start to reduce an amplitude a bit more. Um, so you, know, you can actually consider a slow limiter as a type of low pass filter in this instance. Uh, to consider that, let's put in a sawtooth wave. So you can see the uh, the the vertical drop on this ramp, or or if it was an inverted sawtooth wave, uh, there's a bit more shaping. So that's due to like the minimum slew durations from the follower circuit. So certain waveforms will maybe not translate as as purely, but uh, triangles sit very very cleanly. So. With that frequency range with minimum slew, it's actually quite a, a versatile audio processor that has a, a wide bandwidth of frequency range it can it can work with. Uh, what I'm going to do next is look at a square wave, which will give us a better read on what the rise and fall parameters do. Go an octave down. There we go. So square wave, again, similar to the sawtooth, we've got a bit more curvature naturally to the rising and falling edges as a, as a minimum. As I increase the attack time, I'll keep things linear just now, you can see I'm able to slope that down so that I now have a linear ramp over the half cycle of that square. And same with my release. So I've now successfully converted my square wave into a triangle through wave shaping. So the issue being from a wave shaping perspective, if I change the frequency, I lose amplitude or I lose triangular shape. So the slew rates are frequency dependent uh, in terms of wave shaping application because uh, where these are defined, that sets a, a fixed um, duration for ramping up to, uh, over a certain amplitude jump and in reverse falling down. But if I were to have, you know, like this circuit tied to frequency or I was manually adjusting these pots, then that's, you know, that's a valid way to produce a triangle wave from a square wave in this context. Um, let's look at the shape control. So at the moment it's set to linear, so I'm getting a triangular shape. I go to exponential, we now have this uh, classic more sort of shark fin uh, logarithmic rise exponential fall. Very typical of uh, you know, ADSRs or any envelope shape really. The frequency the, or the timing ranges of the attack and release uh, have, have matched pretty closely between them. Um, so if you've got a, a certain shape match to a certain frequency if you change that to linear then the ramp should be a pretty good ballpark of comparison between linear ramps and exponential logarithmic ramps. Okay let's look at the gate output now as a last comparison. Um, what I'll do, I'll take rise and fall all the way down and let's go to a sawtooth wave. I'll now, instead of pulling from here, I'm going to view the gate. Reduce the grid a bit. So we can see what the threshold's actually doing is it's a comparator against this unipolar positive voltage. So anything, if I, as I increase the threshold, 
the peak has to hit a higher peak until the gate will turn on or the trigger will turn on and likewise if it's lower down so this is in fact not really any different than uh, what we would get from square wave output from square wave with PWM's wave shaping on an oscillator uh, exact same approach I've lost my source where were we here we go so yeah our last uh, wave shaping technique we can get PWM over a sawtooth wave or, or any any variable wave really so it just changes the way the duty cycle moves when it's a triangle so that's more the the fundamentals of what's going on in in an envelope follower so uh, let's uh let's try some some patch examples using it in more musical context let's do something a bit more synthesis focused and uh, you know musically useful with uh, with this envelope follower uh, i'm going to build a basic basic synth voice i'll just come from the the, the final output of the lower voice of the csl and just a wave folded sine wave and to control it i'm going to use an envelope to open to, to like you know effectively ping or strike the uh, the wave fold depth here and that is going to come from my envelope output from the envelope follower. Now for an audio source, if I hit the switch down here, I'm using the built-in microphone as a source going down to the follower input. Uh, the transient peaks of that are are being followed as an envelope. Uh, we could actually visualize this in parallel. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Just the gain of there we go. So it's really quick transients picking up from just percussive taps and snaps uh, and if we view this envelope in parallel we'll see exactly what voltage is being produced in tandem to these spikes so I've got set an exponential which often sounds a lot more natural to this sort of implementation uh, if I'll set to linear we'll have a slower drop in or, you know, a more long lasting audible drop I guess compared to exponential where it drops off at an exponential rate uh, natural sounds or you know we hear sounds I guess logarithmically technically but uh, sounds like impulses from acoustic instruments are uh, exponential in nature in, in in their uh, em natural envelope, so that's why exponential envelope generation here is a, a much uh, more natural example. So, not the most useful patch. Uh, I guess uh, I could uh, go a step further, use the gate to clock a sample and hold, and then use that as pitch over my oscillator. And if I get the threshold just right, then I may be able to get a bit more control via dynamics over there we are. external ambient sound control over a very crude synth voice, but uh, a synth voice. Okay, let's uh, use something a bit more musically relevant. Uh, I'm going to bring back in my acoustic drum recordings into the line to modular. So 
we can see the amplitude peaks coming from the, the raw audio and the, the envelope being produced from it uh, in parallel. So let's, uh, what I'll do, I'll crossfade between my synth voice and the actual acoustic drums so we can hear exactly what's happening in the context. Okay, synth voice, drums. So, so far I've kept attack down low and release up high. So uh, the issue when increasing attack is, especially if it's very transient heavy signals, uh, maybe more so in this case with the, uh, the microphone. We've gone straight to synth voice. Uh, it's not very audible, so the amplitude of the envelope is greatly reduced so if it's a very if it's a very quick transient signal then you know so in practice that that big negative spike is folded up positive it's it's looked at as a, a trigger during the duration of that trigger the attack would need to reach up to its peak which if the the trigger the impulse is too short you're never going to hit that actual uh, voltage peak uh, with it so as you increase attack in general, unless it's a sustained sound you're following, uh, you're not going to get uh, a very high amplitude envelope. So, quick attack, long release is a, a good rule of thumb. Let's go back to drum voice. It's doing a really good job at picking out all the all the hits, all the various transients, kick, snare, you know, hi hat, independently. Um, so, how can we utilise this further? Uh, I'm going to do some spectral analysis. I guess is the technical term. In practice, I'm just taking my raw drum voice and running it through a low pass filter. So, uh, if we listen to that first. filtered drums. So what I'm listening for is just picking out that kick drum. So snare and kick, are, you know, they actually share a lot of that lower frequency fundamental. Like the, the fundamental of a snare drum is deceptively low. But there's a much, there's a lot more boominess to the kick here, so let's see if that's, that's going to be enough to isolate it. So low pass filter and this is going to be my new envelope follower source. Much more prominent spikes on just the, the kick. So say I want to isolate that further, um, this is where we're getting into an overlap into music production techniques, where uh, uh, compression is an obvious one, but uh, more importantly noise gate, which uh, you know, the terms align perfectly. So we have a gate signal produced from threshold analysis over this envelope, so I'm going to gate the audio, which is what noise gate is. So let's um, take our drum voice. Let's, uh, let's come pre-oscilloscope and I'm going to run this through Vinca as a VCA and to start let's um, let's go to just drums and I'm going to use the envelope I was using to strike the wave folder and I'll use that to isolate the kick a bit. So we're getting amplitudes of other stuff through, even though the snare's greatly reduced in amplitude compared to the kick, as we can see on the scope, uh, due to the filtering. Yes, maybe got rid of the, the toms and snare a bit more. 
So now if I change from using my envelope output to using my gate signal, we've got quite aggressively isolated pick hits now. Um, it's very aggressive sonically because it's just, you know, it's just a burst of burst of sound so you know zero crossings are ignored it's not a, it's not smart enough to to know that it's just detecting amplitude and then comparing it to a threshold so to get that a more useful control over amplitude i'm going to use this gate and run it through a cease envelope here so if i have attack all the way down decay all the way down release all the way down and sustain up this is acting as a signal follower so my gate is just passing through the ADSR with no rise and fall level. But now... I can soften the onset clicks of the transients by bringing up a slight amount of attack and having a bit of release so that just tails it off quite naturally. So that's quite a, quite a usable isolated kick now. So I raised the cutoff frequency and that's brought the snare hits in. If I was using bandpass filter, I guess I could, you know, maybe try and hone in on just the, the snare, where the snare's sitting in the spectrum. So yeah, that's how to create a noise gate from an envelope follower. And uh, yeah, a, a bit of expansion using the, the gate into an envelope, into a, an envelope generator. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, this is this is basically what's built into every noise gate VST plugin. Um, that's a a classic staple in music production. So while we're on the subject of audio production techniques, um, I figured compression might be a good uh, good example to to hit to cover with uh, using the envelope follower on the ladder. Um, dynamics managers and compressors in general seem to be very in right now in modular, which. Uh, I think is a very good sign. Uh, adds a an extra level of control to uh, you know the production side, musically, compositionally, uh, not just the synthesis patching. So there's a lot of overlap in the in the approaches. So to do this, I'm going to use the Vinca as my VCA, and uh, I'll stick with the acoustic drum samples I've been I've been using so far. Uh, let's get some audio going. I'll keep this all mono, because uh, I've only got one Vink in this system at the moment. Uh, okay, so this is my mono sum of my line to modular drum signal. And I've got that going into the lower input in the Vinca. Uh, it's a four quadrant multiplier, so the top actually has its own attenuverter and sums with this bias. So bias all the way up. This is me now at Unity Gain audio throughput. Uh, I've got the switch engaged to the up position, so that's now got the signal going down to the follower and producing my envelope. So compression is deceptively simple. I mean, it's it's in a nutshell, it is just level control. It's just amplitude control. So it's just a case of automating reduction in loudness based on either the the signal's own loudness, so uh, it's, it's reducing peak amplitudes of, of transients, or uh, it's, it's, it's evening out and uh, making a, a, a more general average of the, uh, the loudness over uh, signal amplitude uh, over time. So the way that we're going to do this, we're going to use our envelope to reduce the, the level. So the same way that here, if I were to like manually manually control the bias, and try and match it so I'm ducking down at the same time as the kicks. Uh, that's not a very practical way of controlling amplitude, but in practice it's uh, exactly what a compressor does. So I'm using the positive one, I could use the negative one here, but because I've got an attenuverter it doesn't matter, so I'm just going to pull this down negative. So this is with 
attack and release all the way down. I'm going to start bringing up my release tail so I've got more of a, uh, a release swell as the, uh, the amplitude ramps back up. So the, the typical five parameters on a compressor are threshold ratio, uh, we then got attack release and then makeup gain is uh, the common ones that you might see on a lot more uh, you know, traditionally laid out compressors or versatile compressors. So makeup gain is literally what it, it, it's, it, you know, its name is. It's uh, making up gain based on uh, loss in overall amplitude. So as I start bringing in gain reduction by applying this envelope to duck the loudness, uh, I'm going to have overall a quieter result. So to get makeup gain in here, I can use the Vinca's lower channel, set them to cascading series, and in exponential mode, I actually have a considerable amount of headroom on this VCA. So threshold and ratio are uh, essentially tied together and controlled via this default bias level and then the amplitude or negative amplitude of this envelope, so how much it's ducking it. So on a harder compressor, these will be broken out and uh, more dedicated controls uh, that are affecting both these parameters in, in tandem. I've taken my amplitude depth all the way down of the envelope, and we can clearly hear it's having an effect on the, you know, squashing the, the signal as we go. I reduce the overall level and keep the uh, envelope deeper then we're going to have more aggressive gain reduction so that's increasing the ratio in practice there, that's getting quite quite crushed so attack and release uh, that is you know our slew rates that the, the envelopes generating. Release probably has the most dramatic effect as it controls like the swell of uh, the amplitude, regaining amplitude. I'll try it in exponential, see if that gives us a bit more of a natural effect. It's quite common in uh, your compression of drum voices in particular, or something that's got a lot of high transients. If you have the attack higher than you might expect you would want it. What I'll do, I'm going to show our signal amplitude on the scope for reference. And then I can apply this negative envelope here. Push the position up. Here we are. So we're actually seeing the the gain reduction on this yellow line. If I increase the attack, then I'm slowing, I'm, I'm making the response of the envelope ducking slower. Uh, so what that allows for is, uh, with a faster transient, then the more of the start of the transient gets to pass through before the, the ducking gets applied. So it's quite a useful trick for, for accentuating the, the, the start of a transient uh, or the punchiness of a, of a kick or snare hit. This is no gain reduction applied. With gain reduction applied and let's throw them in and make up gain. I'm going to go into something more aggressive. I'll take attack down, bring release up so we're getting a really aggressively yeah, very aggressively squashed drum voice. Especially that fill at the end that's getting 
completely smashed. So let's um, let's visit a, you know, a common uh, production technique using compression on drum voices, for example. Uh, I've got my compressed version here. I'm going to actually crossfade that with the uncompressed version. Compression. I need to melt the signal. Patch that to the other input of my fader. Uncompressed. Heavily compressed. And now, crossing between the two, this is parallel compression, where there aren't any like simple crash hits much it's more of a constant rate oh there's one there so adding parallel compression in this way to you know maybe the overhead recordings of, of a drum voice you know you'll, you'll get a, a lot more retention of a sustain of a cymbal but without losing losing the uh, the peak transients Yeah, we're uh, kind of blurring the lines between uh, music production techniques, dynamics management, and synthesis patching. Like uh, you, know, you can quite quickly see how this might be uh, usefully applied to a patch. If you've got an envelope follower and a VCA, you'd be able to like rein stuff in, or of course use it for sidechain compression, where we've got this envelope derived from a, a keyed source. So let's uh, let's try that. I'm going to, instead of using my drum source going to the VCA, I'm going to change that to being the gain reduction off. Let's uh, run that through a filter just so we've got a bit more of a musical option. So now I'm going to reapply the gain reduction coming from this envelope. So I'm now side chaining the compression of my synth voice from the drums. further and actually integrate it into being more of a controlled patch. I'm using the gate out from my envelope threshold detection. Use that to clock a sample and hold. Quantize that. And then use this as a vote for Octosource. Sidechain compression. So 
here's one more trick where I've got this parallel envelope here so as well as using it to sidechain and compress the amplitude of my synth voice what if we do it spectrally sidechain compression over the overall amplitude but I'm using the same envelope coming from my drum hit uh, I'm actually using that so I'm using the negative one here pulled from the same yellow trace and I'm attenuating it negative so I've now got that as a positive envelope opening the filter cutoff of the voice and the whole thing clocked from the amplitude peaks of this drum sample. So this brings us to our uh, lowest section of the Larach, which is the foot pedal interface section. Uh, the module itself ships with this uh, control box, which, uh, you know, it's a sturdy guitar pedal design. Um, but uh, I, I, I found these buttons which are more of a, a soft press which uh, are much more comfortable for playing with hands as well as feet uh, you know compared to the, the more clicky buttons you get on a, a typical guitar pedal uh, so these connect via a quarter inch cable which uh, is also supplied in the box and that patches in here giving us control via our A and B buttons so the A button controls these two upper outputs, uh, the gate output, so that just follows the button pushes directly. And the trigger output will trigger on any rising edge of the gate. Uh, so the duration pot here all the way down and the trigger will be 5 milliseconds all the way up and it will be 500 milliseconds, give or take. Um, if the if the trigger's re-triggered like, while it's still high, it essentially resets that timer. So you can have it sustaining if it's re-triggered within the, within the duration of the, the, the trigger pulse. Uh, yeah, right, gate and trigger, a nice classic combo. Um, the B button, which uh, connects uh, via the, the ring contact on the, on the cable, uh, that is produced at this lowest gate output and the output state is indicated by the LED button here. Uh, the button itself is a, a latching toggle, much in the same way that the, the tine has, has latching states. So if, if it's high, the output is high. If it's low, the output's low. Uh, the state of that latching toggle uh, is combined with the B button logic uh, as a uh, in XOR configuration. So if the latching state is off, any time the button's pushed, we've got active high behavior. If the button's high, then we've inverted it. So we've got active low control via the B button. Uh, so yeah, it gives a, a good range of control over, over elements of a patch, either on foot or just remote from the system via, via the box. So let's see how we can configure this into some interesting patches. So let's start with a uh, remote controlled kick kick patch. Uh, I'm going to use the pedal section in addition to the follower. So uh, this is going to be a patch using only the ladder and uh, 1047. Uh, I'll use I'll maybe use a few different stages of the ladder for signal processing, but the actual um, you know, synthesis part, this is going to be using trigger to trigger an envelope and that's going to be striking and uh, controlling the, the, the resonant filter. So I'll have this trigger signal. I'm going to patch that to the follower input. This means I've got a trigger signal that's been voltage followed. If I have attack all the way down, it means uh, during that trigger pulse, uh, the voltage will get to its maximum uh, immediately and it's then going to decay down 
at the, the rate of the, the release. So we can visualize this on the scope. Move this position back down. There we go. So there's my envelope pulse. Uh, I'm going to use the gate output, which is going to be triggered. It's basically following my trigger signal. And I'll use that to ping, ping the filter. Let's listen via the low pass output. I'll run this through. I'll run this through the scope as well, so we can see the the output waveform. So at the moment, this envelope is completely unrelated. Uh, this is just pinging the filter, and it's sitting at a resonant tone, you know, eight to eight style resonant filter. So now I'm going to use the envelope and patch that into my FM input. I'm going to use this to pull the pitch down. There we go. So there's less of a stable tonal bass to this kick. I'm getting uh, this exponential drop envelope adding more of a, a transient kick. That's sounding pretty good. Uh, I think to enhance this more, let's use the enhance channel on, on the ladder. added a bit more body to it. So this is a harmonic distortion coming through the, the wave shaping limiting of the, the enhanced circuit. I'm going to take this a step further and actually instead of running directly into the enhance, I'm going to patch this into my line to modular gain stage. Uh, I'll select that as a source, so that's normally down to my enhance channel. So all the way down, that should be approximately unity gain passing through this stage. But it's now offering me up to up to plus 40 dB in gain. Used gate output, could use that to clock my sample and hold, and use this to affect amplitude of my source. Breaking the rules, I'm adding a vinca, adding a VCA. But you can never have too many VCAs.
This is now varying the amplitude as it goes into the initial gain stage. So some hits will have more prominence. So, uh, I mean, this could be curated much more uh, specifically so that I could have uh, you know, a sequence deriving when there's an accented hit versus a non-accented hit. Yeah, a remote controlled kick. Uh, let's do something a bit more involved, uh, utilizing the, uh, the the foot controller from the, or the hand controller from the, the latter. Uh, this, this, these are a few patching techniques that I've been experimenting with recently. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite a specific use case in certain regards, but a lot of it is transferable skills that uh, could be useful in any number of patches. So uh, I'm gonna, keep with my acoustic drum loops, which uh, I've got here. Uh, and I'm going to, just for reference, so I'll use the looper and I'll, I'll basically capture in uh, a take of that that I can then use as a self-contained modular uh, audio source. So let's see how we can do this. Okay, so let's put it into input monitoring mode. So with the LED pulsing here, when I hit the record button, it starts monitoring. I can then start recording. Loop it. And erase. Uh, and to show that external control, let's use the B button gate out here for Recording, if I screw it up, I would want to erase, so I could use the erase in here. So this is a way of me uh, externally controlling this method. Erase, so input monitoring, erase to snap that out. And record a loop. So let's see if I can get this timed. So hit B to start monitoring. I'll then hit record on the end of this fill. There we go, that's pretty seamless. I can even stop the audio playback on Ableton now. That'll do. So that kind of shows an example of how you might use uh, the foot pedals with the looper for a more traditional, like a you know, loop station type uh, type context. Uh, so this is now simply just a, an audio source for me to use. Um, so let's build it up a bit and create more of a synth voice around this and then I'm going to integrate the ladder foot control into being a, you know, more control over elements of this patch. Uh, so first off, I'm going to run this through my envelope follower. So I'm using the uh, aspects of this voice. Actually, even better still, I'll run it through the filter and I can isolate down to the kicks, like I did in a previous example. Yeah, that looks like it's more promptly hitting on the, the kick sounds. Um, I want to use an audio source from this. I can use the aux out. Uh, I'll run it through a 1F because I'm going to use that that further stage for crossfading between things anyway. Okay, so let's use this envelope to open a wave folder in this voice. That will be my synth voice that will mix in with the drums. Yeah, that's quite nicely isolating just the 
kick drums. That was the issue. That's probably it. Cool. Okay, I'll use this trigger as well to. Um, hmm, I'm going to be using the sampler mode further on. What I'll do to give me more variation to notes, I'll just create a staggered CV source from from the oct here, and let's quantize that. low depth so we're just uh, moving through a handful of notes So it's more than just a kick. There we go. Okay, so what I want to do is use my A button to essentially gate the, uh, the audio playback here. So let's come from the output of my 1F and I'm going to patch that through a VCA. Use the A button here as a CV source. There we go. Manual gating over the amplitude. Uh, I'll take advantage of the trigger output here and I'm going to patch that to the retrig input on the looper. So I can now re-trigger the start of the loop, so it gives me an ability to keep the, the rhythmic playback in time. If I wanted a bit more prominence, I could even uh, you know, synthesize a, a parallel kick so that on that hit I've got a more prominent, punchy, synthesized kick. Uh, yeah, there's many options that we can go with. Uh, so. The interesting one that I've been playing with that I'm going to do with the B button switch is use the Arbor's reverb mode to manually control reverb throws over this, this more complex voice. So to do that, I'll need to run my audio through the Arbor to start with. Uh, benefit of this is Arbor has two outputs, so I can run this to a degree in stereo. So this is just dual mono at the moment. Uh, and I'm going to be using the mod CV input on the Arbor's expander. Uh, and that's what I'm going to pull control from, from this guy. So the Arbor's reverb has a bipolar control scheme. So at the moment, I'm sending positive voltage to that. That hitting a full gate, you know, if it's if it's five volts or more, then that's the maximum reverb control. But the uh, the mod CV input will actually take zero to five or zero to negative five. Uh, zero to negative five, giving me uh, a different, a slightly different reverb. So uh, this one the reverb applied, uh, we still have the dry signal coming through. When it's sent negative voltage, uh, the dry signal is removed, so we end up with uh, a different freezing reverb uh, when it's at maximum 5 volts. So I want to be able to take advantage of that. So anytime I press the B button, I want that to you know, either be full positive or full negative. So how do we do that? Um, there's a trick that I've been experimenting with. If I use my gate signal and use that to... 
do two things at once. I'll need to malt this. So take that multiple. I'm going to patch one send to this VCA, where if I press the B button, I'm opening, you know, I'm fully attenuated that, so that's going to be opening the signal passing through this VCA. The source is going to be from the sample and hold. So every time I press the B button, I'm opening up whatever source is coming from the sample and hold. If I use my multiple again and use the same gate to clock the sample and hold, it's going to give me faster, more direct control. Now, at the moment, it's random sampling of white noise, so it's going to be anywhere from you know the negative to the positive maximum amplitudes. Uh, I want this to just be hard, you know, positive five or hard negative five or you know anything exceeding those those levels. So to do that, I'm going to use the square wave from my same oscillator source as my sample source. So now anytime I press the button, I'm going to be either landing full positive or full negative. And it's kind of like coin toss logic because it depends on when I sample where the, you know, whether it's in positive or negative part of the duty cycle of that audio square wave. Uh, yeah, sort of an analog coin toss logic. Quite a useful thing in and of itself. So let's let's do this. Um, I'll use the output of my VCA. Let's uh, run that through the, the scope just so we can see it in action. And the, the output of my random coin toss gate, that's going to go to mod CVN. So now I can play the voice through and I can throw a reverb throw. So we can hear this uh, negative reverb. It's got a different character. It's kind of set more in the background. It's a, more of a spatialized algorithm. So if I keep it on full negative, as I let audio pass, we're not hearing the dry, we're just hearing, we're just hearing the wet of the reverb algorithm. So it's uh, a really nice technique for getting a sort of spectral smear as part of this reverb throw. So if I land the reverb throw on on a transient that has pinged the fill the wave folder, then I'm able to like grab elements of a of a note. I don't need to dive in in amongst patch cables. I've got uh, more of a remote control over audio throughput and reverb throws. Let's do something a bit different. Uh, I'm going to do an unboxing of Alara so we can see exactly what comes in the box. First up, we have Quick Start Guide. Tom's done a really good job in this one, and it's much more clearly laid out than the module's actual layout. What, uh, what all the signal flow is, how things are normal, rooted. Okay, so we have our pedal. Good solid enclosure. Easier to press buttons. 
uh, and of course it comes with the uh, uh, 1.5 meter quarter inch TRS cable for connecting straight to the pedal input on the module itself. I appear to have dropped the screws, there we go. And here's the module. It's uh, ever so slightly deeper than some of my other single PCB design ones because the quarter inch jack protrudes a bit more. So instead of what's normally 27 millimeters, uh, it's 30 centimeters uh, from faceplate to to the deepest point there. But uh, depending on your case, it's uh, you know if you've got space at the bottom with busboard above, then it still gives plenty of room to get it in nice and nice and close. And the important part, let's see what we got. We've got an ether card. That's a, that's a rare one. Hope you enjoy.